Okay, so today uh, I'm more or less confining our discussion to just one year, really. But an important year, the year 1798. And so I, I assume you've glanced at it and you're sort of familiar with the basic outline of events. I'm going to try to embellish that a bit and elaborate on what you've read. Uh, we start in this, looking at 1798, um, with just an observation that the events that transpire here and the ideas that are put forth were not confined to the year 1798, but reverberated over the next uh, several decades. And the ideas that became known as the principles of 98, uh, of course 1798, influenced American history all the way up through the, the Civil War. So this is not just a, a fluky incident that we're spending time on. I spend time on it because it's important and it recurs in American history. These ideas keep coming up. But at the same time, they're ideas that most textbooks uh, uh, disregard altogether. So what is so big about 1798? What's exactly going on? Well, basically we've got two things. We've got the Alien and Sedition Acts, and then we have the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions in response to them. The Alien and Sedition Acts were a series of, of uh, acts passed by the Congress, signed by President John Adams, whose purpose was to make it uh, easier for the United States government to carry on what was known as the quasi-war with France. The quasi-war with France refers to a period of the relationship between the United States and France that was very cold, to say the least, in the late 1790s, and that involved a series of occasional on-again, off-again naval clashes uh, between the two countries. Uh, relations between the two countries had deteriorated really ever since the American state colonies and then states had, had reached a separate peace with Britain and had grown more and more friendly to the British over time. The French had grown more alienated. There are a variety of reasons for the hostility. For our purposes, the point is that there was hostility between the uh, United States and France such that I, I typically point out that uh, President John Adams was often seen in public with a sword at his side as if to indicate to people that uh, the country was on some kind of a war footing. Well, the Alien and Sedition Acts were intended, uh, among other things, to criminalize speech that was uh, derogatory about the U.S. government, to criminalize speech that might cast this war effort in uh, negative terms or that might simply cast the United States government in a negative light that might bring it into disrepute among the population. <coughs> so the Alien Acts involved immigrants uh, and people who were not U.S. citizens and empowered the president, among other things, to deport uh, uh, enemy aliens. When the United States was at, was at war with some country, if there were any citizens of that country in the United States, they could be deported and so on and so forth. But what we really want to look at is the sedition legislation because the Sedition Act made clear that uh, it was a crime to speak ill of the United States government in a way that, as I say, would bring the government into disrepute. And um, in, it seems that that's obviously a violation of the First Amendment protection of the freedom of speech. Um, it wasn't obvious at the time. There was a consensus of opinion in 1798 that the First Amendment did not cover seditious speech, that if you were saying something that will tend uh, in a very serious way to bring the, the government to disrepute, this is not covered by the First Amendment. The understanding that a lot of people had in the 1790s was that the First Amendment simply said that there is no prior restraint on anything you might say. In other words, there's no censorship board that's going to prevent you from publishing something. That's what free speech meant. However, once you've said it, once it's been published, you could then be punished for it, and that would be consistent with the First Amendment according to some interpretations. So it was not an obvious home run to say that these restrictions on free speech violate the First Amendment. It was not obvious to uh, at least some people. Thomas Jefferson thought it violated uh, the First Amendment, but as I say, this is not the general consensus. If anything, the Sedition Act in the, in the United States was more liberal than similar legislation elsewhere, like for instance in Britain. Because in the United States, you could, if you were accused of violating the Sedition Act, plead that, well, in fact, all the statements I made were true. Yes, I spoke ill of the U.S. government, but every single statement I made was true, and you could be exonerated on the grounds that you had spoken the truth. Uh, that was not the case in Britain. 
Uh, if anything, um, if you tried to make that argument that, well, I, I only spoke the truth, that would actually make it worse because you're more likely to cause civil unrest if you speak about uh, negative things that are true. But in the American case, you, you could plead that, in fact, uh, you had told the truth and truth was a legitimate defense. Nevertheless, there is something fishy about this Sedition Act uh, on a, a couple of grounds. The constitutional question we'll leave aside for a moment. But there is the question that it might be used for partisan purposes. There were two political parties that were beginning to form in the 1790s. You have the Federalists, uh, of whom the best known representatives would be George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, and the Republicans, not the Republicans of today, um, who were represented best by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, perhaps. And it so happened that uh, the Federalist Party dominated the U.S. government at the time. George Washington, for two terms, had been a Federalist. John Adams, the current president, was a Federalist. The Federalists dominated the U.S. government. Thomas Jefferson, though, was the vice president, and he was a Republican. And so we should pause for a moment to look at that unusual situation. How could it be the president and vice president belong to two parties? And the answer is that the initial rule was that whoever gets the greatest number of votes is elected president, and whoever comes in second is elected vice president. So you get an interesting situation there sometimes. You get people who are at odds with each other in the White House together. And it seemed to Jefferson, uh, the Republican, that this legislation was actually designed to shut down debate, to criminalize the Republican Party, and in effect to aggrandize the, the Federalist Party. That is to say, if a Republican newspaper should be excessively critical of the U.S. government, it could be shut down. And so Jefferson thought that actually what was really beneath this wasn't really any desire to wage war with France more effectively. Really what it was was an attempt to shut down the Republican Party, to criminalize the Republican Party. So he thought it was a partisan measure and that even if it had, didn't originate as a partisan measure, it would be enforced in a partisan manner. And this, was not, this fear was not altogether unfounded. Uh, uh, at least uh, numerous Republican newspaper editors were jailed or fined over the, the course of the existence of the Sedition Act, which expired in 1801. It, ex it was set to expire, by the way, on the very last day of John Adams' administration. So it sort of, again, seems a little suspicious. I mean, what if, what if a Republican had been elected? You know, well, the act will have expired, and so the Republicans won't be able to get their revenge with it. It's also worth noting that if you actually read the Sedition Act, you find that it makes an exception for Thomas Jefferson. It says that you can't criticize the U.S. president, you can't criticize the Congress, and on and on. But it doesn't say anything about the vice president. You can say anything you want to about him, and that's fine. Well, Jefferson happens to be the one, you know, he's, he's the Republican. So again, it seems suspicious here. It seems that this is really designed to punish the, the Republicans. So Jefferson is in this awkward situation because he is, after all, the vice president, and yet at the same time, he wants to encourage Americans to disobey uh, a federal law. So as I say, this is an awkward situation for him to be in. So the course of action he's going to take, he's going to take anonymously. He's going to draft a series of resolutions that are presented to the legislature of Kentucky, and they're known as the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. And then James Madison, who was serving in the con who, uh, after the Constitution, he later served in the Congress and uh, was in close correspondence with Jefferson. James Madison drafted a series of resolutions called the Virginia Resolutions of 1798. And those resolutions, which dealt with the, the constitutional situation they faced, namely this clearly unconstitutional Sedition Act, at least in their view, it was clearly unconstitutional. Uh, these, these measures were proposed to the various states, uh, Kentucky and Virginia. That's why they're known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. It was not uncommon, beginning in the colonial period and carrying on to the early republic, that if you had some kind of a, of a, of a gripe with the U.S. government, or in the colonial period, if you had a gripe with the British government, you would draw up some resolution and have the colonial or later state legislature vote on it. And that, that way, you would in effect be giving the voice of the whole colony or state, saying this is how we feel about such and such a thing. So in 1765, when the British passed the Stamp Act, well, they had uh, the Stamp Act Congress that, uh, that in effect drew, drew up official remonstrances. 
Uh, you have other examples of this. You have the, the um, Virginia Resolves also at the time of the Stamp Act. Well, this is exactly what's going on here, that these two states are going to protest what they see the federal government doing. They think the federal government is going way beyond what it's allowed to do, and they protest with these official resolutions. As I say, the Kentucky one's anonymously drafted by Jefferson. And we want to look at what exactly are these documents saying, because they, these are documents that are the great, sort of the best kept secret of American history. It's not that textbooks don't mention them, but they mention them briefly and in passing and almost always distort their message. And then you, it's, it's as if these, these principles just came and went. These documents and the, the things they said just came and went and they had no long-term consequences. That's the effect uh, of, of uh, most textbooks' treatment of this subject. I want to suggest the opposite, that th these are very important ideas. Well, there's a, a, there's a sort of twofold aspect to these resolutions. First, the resolutions are going to be critical of the Alien and Sedition Acts and explain why they believe them to be unconstitutional. But then the second aspect of them involves what recourse do the states have. So let's do first things first. What's wrong, in, particularly, in particular with the Sedition Act, which is where most of the attention uh, is directed? Well, there are two main arguments that are made against the Sedition Acts. Uh, well, number one is the argument about the freedom of speech. There were some people who did believe that this violated the First Amendment's protection of the freedom of speech. So that argument is cited. But in case you need more evidence that this, there's something wrong with the, the uh, Sedition Act, there's another argument that's used. And that argument comes from not the First Amendment, but the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment of the Constitution was referred to by Jefferson as the cornerstone, the foundation stone of the whole document. That Tenth Amendment had said that any power that the states have not delegated to the federal government is reserved to the states and to the people. So, in other words, unless some power is spelled out in the Constitution, the assumption is the federal government does not have it. It, only, it has only those powers that are expressly delegated to it. Now, that's in effect the message of the Tenth Amendment. Well, how does Jefferson use that? Well, Jefferson says, if the federal government has only the powers that the states have given to it, the Sedition Act is unconstitutional on that ground as well. Because when did the states give the federal government the power to suppress speech? Is it listed anywhere in the Constitution among the federal government's powers that it has the power to suppress free speech? No. So it violates the Tenth Amendment as well. So this is the basic constitutional argument. But now we get to the really the more important issue, because the more important issue here goes well beyond any one passing series of legislative acts. It's the principles that are at stake here. And so I want to lay out what Thomas Jefferson's principles are. Basically, we might list four I don't know if there are four of them. I'm, I'm, uh, he, he didn't number them. I'm just trying to think of his whole, his whole way of thinking and see if I can come up with a, a, a number. Let, let's see if I can confine it to four. Okay, and, and, and these would be basically what we might call the principles of 98. The first of these would be that um, the, federal, the United States government and the Constitution that established it, uh, both of these things were established by representatives of the states. That The states gathered in 1787 and drew up the Constitution, and then those states, one by one, those states ratified the Constitution. So the states created the federal government. They were there first. Uh, 